Today we're going to finish our unit on homicide by talking about the felony murder rule. Uh, the felony murder rule extends from the common law tradition, I'll talk about the MPC in a few minutes, uh, so it's a common law rule uh, that has sometimes been codified in statute and other times has uh, largely been a product of judicial made common law in the area. Um, at its simplest form, as the text notes, uh, the felony murder rule says that any person who commits a felony uh, as an accomplice or is independently liable uh, at where a death occurs during the commission of that felony they are liable for murder uh, um, for that death and so there are three limitations that jurisdictions have sometimes applied and we'll get to those a bit later but that's our basic rule death occurs so you notice it doesn't say a homicide right it's just a death somebody dies during the commission of felony our first case helps to to flesh out this in the commission of felony and the the basic rule here um, this rule has the effect of meaning that a the mens rea uh, for proving the underlying crime is sufficient to establish uh, mens rea for murder. Some judges, you know, say it's really just a case of transferring intent, um, but I don't even think that's right. I mean, I think it's fair to say, we could talk about more in class, this is a form of strict liability murder, meaning no mens rea needs to be tr proven for um, the death uh, as a homicide. And if one of the limitations doesn't apply, the causation limitations, it's not just strict liability, it's also instances where there is no murder at all, uh, meaning, or no homicide at all. The death could have been incidental uh, to the crime, and yet a defendant uh, would still be liable, and all accomplices to that crime would be liable. So what is our definition of a felony? Well, there, there's some variation in the real world, but the simple definition we're going to use, and the one that's true at the federal level, um, is any crime for which the maximum the maximum possible penalty is at least one year in prison or jail. Um, so even if a defendant is sentenced to, say, six months uh, for a crime, as long as the statute authorized a penalty exceeding a year, it will be cons uh, considered a felony. Um, and so this is, you know, just sort of a bright line definition that's commonly used. And so the underlying crime, meaning the predicate felony or the predicate crime, must be statutorily defined as a felony in that regard uh, for it then to be connected to um, uh, the death through a murder charge. There is some variation uh, in the real world about whether it's a first degree murder, second degree murder, um, but we'll just leave that aside for now. Uh, there's also some jurisdictions that have experimented with a misdemeanor manslaughter rule. We're not going to get into that. We're focused on felonies, and at least one of the murder charges is then uh, applied uh, to a defendant because of the participation in a felony where a death occurred. Now the MPC drafters of course would, didn't like this for reasons that should now be pretty obvious to you which is the MPC is very mens rea focused, very focused on the defendant's view of the world and this is an instance where a defendant would be culpable for a crime that not only they may not have caused but one that they have no obvious mens rea toward. Indeed if they did have the purpose or knowing to cause that death and did cause that death uh, a traditional homicide charge would work just as well. Um, and so the MPC drafters did not want the felony murder rule included. However, they did adopt language that at least was a, a um, uh, not quite a compromise, but at least it, they threw a bone to people that wanted to maintain it in the MPC. Um, so this is not technically a felony murder rule, but some people sometimes refer to it as the MPC's version of it. Uh, and what they said is that the extreme indifference, uh, and this is in the MPC's original draft, and, and states have incorporated it to varying degrees, um, stated that an extreme indifference to human life, which was in the second theory of murder uh, under the MPC, uh, is presumed if a defendant was an accomplice or independently culpable for one of these listed crimes. So there's seven crimes here. Robbery, attempted robbery, rape or deviant sexual intercourse by force, arson, burglary, kidnapping, and felonious escape. If it's not on that list, it, that's it. So these are all crimes that are typically felonies, but it doesn't extend to all felonies. And you'll notice that it's not automatic guilt, right? It doesn't, in an instance where the felony gets you the murder conviction as well. Instead, it's a presumption 
uh, that this reckless indifference to human life exists if a person is committing or an accomplice to one of these crimes. Um, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a burden shift. So instead of the government having to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was manifesting extreme indifference to human life, um, it's now up to the defendant to prove by a preponderance of evidence that they were not exercising extreme indifference to human life. And that will be fact-specific, depending upon the nature of the crime, right? So if they commit an arson in a building that's completely walled off, there's no sign of a human being there, and um, you know, there's, they, they inspect it over and over, and then they burn the building, and it turns out at the last minute somebody had run into the fire and died, we might say they're not exercising extreme indifference, even though the presumption will be applied and the jurors will be instructed appropriately. So this is how the MPC, while rejecting the felony murder rule, at least incorporated some of the idea behind it. Because historically, the idea, which we've largely rejected in our law, was that people are basically wicked or good. They're, they're you know, one or the other. And so it was okay, these, these people thought, to say, because they're already committing a serious crime and they have the mens rea associated with that crime and a death results, hmm, we can just, you know, skip all those niceties of mens rea applied to the homicide charge. Um, and so, yeah, this rule is, is um, you know, stems from that tradition, saying the NBC was against, but even common law has largely moved away from. But it's interesting that states, prosecutors uh, in particular, have lobbied to keep this around. Uh, when you see states reviewing their criminal code, you'll often have many experts come in and say, this is just an indefensible rule. It makes no sense, right? If there is an actual homicide, then prosecute it under the normal rules, uh, use you know the, the act requirements, the mens rea, and instruct the jurors that way. This is a shortcut for prosecutors that's just not justified. But states don't want to let it go, and prosecutors don't want to let it go. So it's still frequently used, uh, and it's an easier way for prosecutors to prove uh, murder uh, in cases where particular mens rea evidence is lacking. Uh, so I mentioned, um, well, let, let's do the traditional first in California v. Russell, um, and then I'll get into a little more detail. So uh, in California v. Russell, uh, we we get our we're looking at two different things here of of import. Um, one is what is in the commission of a felony. Uh, when does it begin? When does it end? In particular, when does it end? Here is is important. Um, but there's also um, this is. In this case, we're basically seeing the plain rule applied uh, without modern limitations. They just don't come to bear on the specifics here. Uh, because we know our defendant is committing uh, a felony, right? He is uh, engaged in a residential burglary uh, and a vehicle theft here. Um, ultimately, in a high-speed chase after this burglary, uh, the officer is uh, dies because it's you know 100 mile an hour. I mean, this is a serious, dangerous uh, set of circumstances. Um, so it seems open and shut on the felony murder rule issue, right? If the death of the the officer occurred during the commission of the felony. But we do get to this question of when does the felony end? And, and we did an example early on this semester that also dealt with when does a burglary or theft um, begin and end. And the California doctrine in this area is it ends when the defendant uh, or person who's committing it um, reaches a place of temporary safety, uh, meaning they are no longer um, fleeing or worrying about being caught and detected. And the facts here you know, are, uh, make us wonder whether or not that standard is being applied correctly and how it should apply in this circumstance. Because there is a moment where our defendant might have almost been caught. Our defendant is actually highly intoxicated, and so he makes some bad decisions leaving stuff at the scene or whatever. Uh, there is some question about the exact time passage between when the high-speed chase begins and uh, when the burglary was finished, but it's a decent length of time. And in fact, uh, Berg, you know, uh, Russell here uh, not only you know leaves the scene without any obvious indication uh, that he has been spotted or noticed, um, but it says Russell testified after they left the resident, he dropped McFarlane off at an area near the beach where McFarlane often slept on a boat several blocks away. Russell said he then drove around to see if he could kick it with some friends, but didn't find anyone and got lost in the Oceanside area. So at this point, you know, it there's a 
his testimony is this is a place of temporary safety, right? He's not settled in for the night, but he's looking for friends and something fun to do. Uh, but then he happens upon a police officer, perhaps you know, mistakenly believes that, uh, in fact, uh, his, he might be uh, caught or that report might be out because he is only a couple miles away from uh, the crime scene. And so that's when the chase begins. And so the question for the jury and the appellate court here is, uh, was, was this during the commission of uh, the felony, the burglary? And, uh, you know, the dissent, I think, is, is right um, uh, to point out that, yeah, the felony murder rule definitely applies to the burglary crime here, not to, to the other uh, uh, predicate crimes. But it seems like that, that felony was done, right, that this conduct did not occur, the high-speed chase that followed did not occur during the commission of that felony. Uh, and I think the dissent has a pretty good argument here that that's kind of crazy that, that, that we've gone through dropping off someone, gone through red lights, gone, you know, tried to find friends. And at this point, if that's not temporary safety, then it would be hard to identify when it would have occurred. Um, you know, but ultimately the the majority, of course, by nature of being the majority, wins out here and say, no, there, there's enough evidence that the jurors can say uh, this was an ongoing part of the burglary because he had not reached a point of temporary safety. And therefore, the fact that the officer's death um, uh, resulted during the commission of that felony, it's a murder conviction, right? And so that's why uh, the defendant here gets a sentence of 26 years to life. And one thing it's helpful to do in any felony murder case when we're studying and learning is to think, well, what would have happened without the felony murder rule here? And I think the answer is um, the defendant would, of course, have the vehicle theft and the residential uh, burglary here, uh, but it wouldn't be a murder charge. This would likely be a involuntary manslaughter conviction, right? It's the reckless conduct of the defendant that caused the officer's accident. And that's quite a bit of difference, right, between a murder conviction and a reckless manslaughter. So it's not that the defendant would escape liability entirely uh, for the injury of the officer, but we wouldn't associate him with, say, an intentional killing, um, which is what the felony murder rule does here. Okay, so that's our first case with the basic rule and showing us the scope of a felony is often an important issue for deciding the timing of the death and, and how does it relate. Oh, I put in the wrong slides again, so I'll just skip over the discussion questions and instead uh, go right to the three possible modern limitations. Now, important possible here, meaning some jurisdictions might have zero of these, some might have one, some might have two, and some might have all three. But these are three things that have either been added into statutes about the felony murder rule or sometimes adopted by judges. So, uh, the first one is an inherently dangerous felony, right? Because it, it, our criminalization um, and mass incarceration parts of our, our system these days um, have been, you know, growing over time. We're criminalizing more and more things and we're penalizing more and more. And so, a lot more things are considered felonies than maybe when the felony murder rules um, uh, was first came about. So, one argument and one limitation here is, well, at least we should limit it to felonies that we associate with a high degree of danger and risk of death. So since it's election day, I'll give an example that seems probably trivial and unlikely, but, you know, it could happen, which is imagine somebody committing voter fraud. Um, and, you know, somebody who's working at the, the desk um, discovers that, in fact, uh, they're committing voter fraud, which is defined as a felony in this jurisdiction that I'm, I'm describing. And is so shocked and upset, they, they yell at the person and it causes their uh, heart uh, to seize and they have a heart attack and die. Well, if we say that that under the traditional rule during the commission of the felony, and we assume the voting fraud is ongoing at this moment, uh, and a death occurred, that should be a murder conviction for uh, the voter fraud uh, as the predicate felony. However, if a jurisdiction's adopted this inherently dangerous limitation, uh, we'd say, no, 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 no. Voter fraud is not inherently dangerous. It's not associated with a high risk of death or serious bodily injury. And so the fact that the death occurred means uh, you'd have to use a, a regular old homicide theory here to prosecute the defendant, which is certain to fail, right? Because it's not even negligent homicide to engage in voter fraud and then have somebody rage against you and happen to have them have a heart attack and die. So this would be an extreme difference, right? Without this limitation, the defendant's guilty of murder, right? With the limitation, they are not at all guilty of any homicide. In both cases, uh, the voter fraud uh, uh, 
charged should stick and they should be convicted. Um, this is also important in drug crimes, sometimes which are defined as felonies. Certain drug crimes, like at the high level of uh, running a, a major operation, we might think are inherently dangerous because there's a risk of overdose, there's a risk of violence because of turf wars and such, but maybe simple possession uh, marijuana as opposed to say heroin maybe there's less inherent danger so there's there there is you know sometimes a, an analysis that courts have to do to decide if the underlying crime is inherently dangerous and then there's a question of whether they should focus on the specific facts of the case or use a categorical approach the entire crime and this relates back to um, you know so we looked at Johnson way back in vagueness whether we should look at the whole category of a crime for deciding violence in those cases the here we're talking about risk of death inherently dangerous category Categorical versus a non-categorical approach. Okay, what's the second modern limitation? Well, the second one's causation, which is really just a restatement of the act requirement. Because one of the things I mentioned about the traditional rule at the beginning of this talk is uh, the death merely has to be coincident in timing and in place uh, of the felony. And that doesn't mean the defendant had to have caused it, right? They, they may have not caused it in any way. It just happened at that moment in the temporal and geographic space where the crime is occurring, someone died, right? It could have been, you know, just their, their time was up, it was natural causes, and, and it wasn't, couldn't be linked to the defendant's conduct. Um, under the traditional rule, we'd still say, well, the defendant's liable for a murder there. The death occurred during the commission of felony. But the causation requirement says, no, you at least have to establish the act requirements here, that there is a proximate or but-for cause of uh, the death, uh, so that it's not just a wholly a coincidence. But this, you know, still raises questions in specific cases. And again, drugs have, have been a prominent um, um, issue here, which is, say, a drug dealer sells somebody um, something um, that they overdose with. Um, well, if the sale's complete and the person's taken back to their home, then the drug dealer is not liable uh, because it's not during the commission of the felony more. That felony ends when the transaction's complete. But let's instead imagine a dealer who's more throwing a house party, and it might not even be somebody you think of as a dealer. It's just somebody who throws a nice party and drugs are available. And so somebody keeps going and, and getting the freely available drugs that are, say, stored in a bathroom, and um, over the course of a night, they, they eventually overdose and die. Well, then we might say the felony was ongoing. It was an ongoing sort of distribution. And there's a question of causation there, right? Whether or not that intervening act of a person consuming the drug um, breaks our proximate or but-for causation analysis, or uh, whether it's sufficient. And jurisdictions have split on this question of the felony murder rule applying in drug distribution cases. So that's an example where, you know, even with the limitation, we still get varying outcomes depending upon the state. The third limitation, and the one we're going to talk about in our last case, is probably the most complex. Um, it gets back to a concept that I've mentioned before, but not, you know, you don't have to understand the the, the doctrine that underlies the merger rule, which is double jeopardy, right? In, in our world, you cannot charge people uh, with the same crime uh, multiple times, uh, meaning you couldn't come up with, say, a, an imaginary stat set of statutes, one of which is called homicide, one is called murder, one's called killing people, one's called making people dead, whatever we want to do, and they all have the same elements. Those merge together, meaning that even if the prosecutor submits all of them, uh, the defend if the jury finds them guilty of one, it merges, and that that's the one, usually the most serious if there's a merger. This also applies to lesser included offenses. So in the case of a traditional homicide prosecution, I've said prosecutors might offer first degree murder, second degree murder, uh, involuntary manslaughter, and negligent homicide to the jurors. And the jurors can return guilty on all four, but what that means is they merge together, and ultimately it's only the first degree uh, murder charge that, that remains. Um, what does this have to do with the felony murder rule? Because this is operating differently. Well, the idea here is that if a, um, the underlying felony isn't quite exactly the same, right? It's not just a mere image of homicide, but instead is what many jurisdictions use the phrase integral part of homicide, meaning that it's something from which the difference between uh, the homicide and not, then in those cases, you shouldn't be allowed to use that predicate felony uh, as the basis for a felony murder conviction. And it turns out um, the prime example of this is aggravated assault, which is assault with a deadly weapon, uh, meaning that uh, 
large majority of our homicides are committed by assault uh, with a deadly weapon. And so it would be strange and, and perhaps just wrong uh, to say that it, the prosecution merely has to prove the mens rea for the aggravated assault, meaning they used a deadly weapon, and they wouldn't be able to argue, well, I didn't mean to kill them, right? I just meant to use the deadly weapon. I shot them in the leg. I didn't realize that you know, they would bleed out because they, they, their blood doesn't clot because they're a hemophilic or something like that. Um, under a traditional homicide prosecution, defense would be able to make that argument, right? But if we don't have the merger limitation and we have the felony murder rule, then the defendant is out of luck because the government doesn't have to prove the mens rea uh, for the homicide. They only have to prove the mens rea for the aggravated assault, which by shooting somebody in the leg, you definitely have uh, met. And so uh, Montana is an instance here of a state uh, that does, has the felony murder rule, but does not have the merger limitation. So let's talk about our case here, because it really helps to flesh out why this doctrine is important and why many jurisdictions have adopted it. Um, because here we have, you know, I mean, we have some bad people and some bad criminals. They're bad people and that they did, you know, cause the death of another and, and they definitely you know hitting somebody with a ball peen hammer in the head is nothing um to, to you know scoff at it's a very serious crime they're also bad criminals because they they they're come up they they basically volunteer themselves into the case it's not clear uh that they would have been discovered um but for their bad and suspicious uh cover stories here um so eventually you know they're they're caught and um the the prosecution proceeds by arguing the felony murder rule theory here you know they could also argue the other theory right they can say that in this case uh, the defendant uh, meant to kill uh, the victim, Bedeau, but with the felony murder rule, they get a shortcut. They don't have to say there was an intent to kill or that there was a reckless indifference to human life or anything like that. They can just say there was an intent to commit an aggravated assault. And yeah, so it's a, it, it allows them to bypass all those mens rea rules that we talked about uh, when we looked at murder. And so the net effect here is the prosecution doesn't have to prove homicide mens rea. They only have to prove the aggravated assault mens rea. And the majority upholds this. Um, and I, you know, if they're not going to adopt the merger rule, this is the legally right outcome, right? In other words, this is what happens. You allow a shortcut, a workaround, so that the government does not have to prove mens rea for homicide in certain cases, and they're still able to get a uh, murder conviction. Uh, the dissent, notably, doesn't um, say, well, maybe we should adopt the merger doctrine instead. They adopt a view, which many hold, which is that the felony murder rule itself is just wrong and unconstitutional, and it should be thrown out. And this actually takes us back to Morissette, right? Remember, Morissette was our... our one of our first big uh, uh, mens rea cases. Justice Jackson talked about why uh, mens rea is the norm in our system, why it should be presumed. Strict liability is a very rare exception. Um, and he talked about things like public welfare offenses. And the dissent here thinks, uh, understandably, that this is just strict liability uh, homicide, that you are making people guilty for a very serious crime uh, for which they lack the mens rea. And sometimes you'll see courts say, well, no, really, we're not, we're not, it's not strict liability, we're transferring the mens rea from one crime to another, which itself is not really um, great in our system. But we also know that statement isn't true, because in fact, in many cases, the felonies mens rea can be something like negligence or recklessness. It could be a less serious crime, and if we were our less serious mens rea, and if we were merely transferring, say, a reckless mens rea to homicide, then the person would only be guilty of involuntary manslaughter. They wouldn't be guilty of murder. So it's not just the case that we're transferring mens rea. It's saying they are guilty of the highest level of mens rea, or second if it's a secondary murder jurisdiction. You'll also notice here that Montana has imported uh, the MPC's definitions of uh, mens rea. They're trying to have a purpose and knowingly. Uh, and still has the felony murder rule. Again, this shows the the messiness of the real world. You know, I, it's important for you to learn the the two traditions that are the basis of our criminal law. But in the real world, they often mix. Um, and I want to want to really push back on the majority's argument here that well, there was plenty of evidence, uh, purpose or knowledge of the homicide here because hitting somebody with a ball peen hammer um, seems to indicate you're trying to kill them by hitting them in the head. And 
that statement can be absolutely true, but it's also why you don't need the felony murder rule, right? If there was evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to that effect, you don't. The government shouldn't doesn't have an excuse here. Just make them retry it with the traditional homicide rules that apply to every other crime, and don't give them this shortcut. So that argument I find um, particularly problematic for the majority to make because it actually undermines the basis for having the felony murder rule in the first place. And so, yeah, it might very well be that Burkhart here should be found guilty of a homicide. But doing it through the felony murder rule, it changes the way uh, our mens rea and even our causation in some cases works in every other wary of criminal law. It's an anomaly. It's an exception that because it carries very serious penalties, in many jurisdictions, death Right, so the felony murder rule applies, um, you know, in, in many death penalty jurisdictions, and many people have been sentenced to death, even though they lack the mens rea for the homicide and for the murder for which serves as the basis of their death sentence. So that's it for the felony murder rule, and for our chapter on murder. Next time we will move to rape and sexual assault.